Welcome once again to Rethinking Democracy in an Age of Pandemic. I'm Eileen Galuli and I direct the Society of Fellows in Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia University. As those of you who have joined us over these past five weeks know well by now, this series is a joint venture with the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is directed by my friend and colleague, Jane Olmeyer, who continues to home shelter from a wee island off the coast of Donegal. As this is our final workshop, Jane will join us at the end on camera to give our great thanks to all of those who made Rethinking Democracy in an age of pandemic possible. A special welcome to all our Zoom room attendees, including many of our colleagues from Trinity, Columbia, the Universities of San Paulo, Virginia, Balistok, Utrecht, JNU, and Ambedkar in Delhi as well as other colleagues, journalists, authors and artists, policymakers, and representatives of government, civic and cultural organizations. And welcome also to those tuning in on Facebook with special thanks once again to Irish Central for helping us get the word out. If you've missed any of our earlier workshops, you can watch them on the Trinity Long Room Hub Facebook page or listen to them as podcast recordings on the Long Room Hub website. Do check out both our websites, Haman Center and uh, Trinity Long Room Hub. Francesco will post the U URLs for more information about the ongoing partnership between our institutions, including our projects with other institutions, some of which have been generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Over the past several weeks, we've considered the impact that the current pandemic has had on our daily lives and on our democratic values. In each of our previous episodes on nations and borders, on marginalized groups, on inequality, and on the everyday, we've returned again and again to the recognition that while the pandemic touches everyone, it does so with an uneven hand. COVID-19 has thrown into high relief the social and economic disparities that structure our Pluto democracy, a word coined in 1895 to describe a form of government that is ruled by formal democratic processes, but one in which only the wealthy have any real power. Today, we explore what it means for citizens without any real power individually to practice democratic values in the midst of a pandemic. At a time when we are not able to exercise our constitutional rights to peaceable assembly, and to make our voices collectively heard since doing so threatens the general welfare. When our rights to a free press are increasingly threatened on several fronts by the concentration of news outlets in the hands of a few who have by now become household names, Bezos, Murdoch, Bloomberg, a concentration that the economic fallout of the current pandemic has only worsened by the fact that more and more people are conducting their lives online at the moment and getting their news exclusively from Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, by attacks on the press as fake news by governments worldwide, while at the same time, bot-driven disinformation is multiplying exponentially. With normal civic life so profoundly disrupted how can we as citizens participate in our, uh, in our democracy? Can democracy function without a robust public sphere? The format today is following what it's been for the last several weeks. There'll be a panel discussion with three speakers. Each speaker will speak up to nine minutes. Then it's over to you, the participants in our Zoom room and our audience on Facebook. We want you to participate. Um, if you're in the Zoom room, you can join the conversation in one of two ways. You can raise your digital hand, click on the icon labeled participants, and then click, let, uh, click raise hand on the bottom of the window of the right side of the screen. When you're called upon, you'll be unmuted to ask your question. Or you can submit your questions throughout the discussion through the Q&A function on your screen, and I'll read your question out for you. If you're on Facebook, please do post your questions in the comments. We'll be collecting these and asking them on your behalf. In all cases, tell us very briefly about yourself, just your name and background. 
We're aware that we have lots of experts in the Zoom room, so be forewarned, we may call on you. If this happens, Francesca will invite you to unmute yourself, or if we'll invite you to unmute yourself, and you can ask your questions uh, directly. We'll also be tweeting with the handles at TLR Hub and at SOF Heyman. Please use hashtag Hub Matters. Now to introduce our panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. Um, first up is Bill Emmett. Bill is a writer and consultant who's best known for his 13 years as editor-in-chief of The Economist. He's the author of 14 books variously on Japan, Asia, the 20th century, and Italy. And he narrated and co-wrote a documentary film about Italy entitled Girlfriend in a Coma. He's currently chair of the Trinity Long Room Hub Board. Melody Barnes is second. Melody is co-director for policy and public affairs for the Democracy Initiative at the University of Virginia. The Dorothy Danforth Compton Professor of Practice at the Miller Center of Public Affairs and a distinguished fellow at the School of Law at UVA. From 2009 until January 2012, she was assistant to the president and director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. She also served as chief counsel to Senator Edward M. Kennedy on the US Senate Judiciary Committee. And our last speaker is Fintan O'Toole, who as you know, is an Irish col uh, Times columnist and writer. And having just this past Friday been admitted as a member of the Royal Irish Academy. He's also a recognized national treasure. Congratulations, Fintan. Uh, Fintan's also the winner of the 2017 European Press Prize and the Orwell Prize. His most recent works include the books, Heroic Failure, Brexit, and Politics, and the Politics of Pain, 2018, and the pop and, uh, the rise, I'm sorry, uh, the pol I'm sorry. <laughs> and also the politics of pain post-war England and the rise of nationalism in 2019. Most recently, as of last week, he wrote a scathing article in the Irish Times entitled, Donald Trump has destroyed the country he promised to make great again, which if you do a Google search is the first thing that comes up on him. Um, so with that, I'm just going to turn it over, I guess, to Bill, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eileen, for that very kind introduction. And uh, let me join your congratulations to the Trinity Long Room Hub and the Columbia and Columbia University for this marvelous symposium series, which I know has been very well attended and, uh, and has, uh, has uh, explored enormous number of uh, very important issues. I'm going to take a kind of overview of the fate of liberal democracies, the fate of the West, uh, perhaps one might say, through the pandemic. Um, and I'm going to start off rather positive and optimistic, and I'll get gloomier as my nine minutes come on. So I'm going to start with my optimistic point, which is that I think that this pandemic, which is after all only, depending on the country you're in, only two, somewhere between two and four months old, so it's all new really, has actually been rather reassuring about the cohesion of our societies. Uh, in Western liberal democracies. We've shown in the face of, obviously, a common health threat, uh, rather more trust in each other and in government than perhaps many studies, many uh, world-weary commentators like me had suggested might be the case um, over the last uh, 10 years. At the same time, if we look at public opinion surveys and uh, like levels of political criticism, and compare them across countries, I think that they are actually falling into quite an appropriate balance. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you look at public opinion, public criticism, it is not directly related to the health outcome, which after all is considered to be something unprecedented, something of an act of God, if I may say, outside the control of government, but rather it's directed at levels of trust, public communication, and perceived competence of government. If one looks at Japan, 
a country that has um, actually done pretty well through the pandemic in health terms with less than 850 deaths for a country of 120 million people, that's remarkable. And yet Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is at, his, at record low approval ratings. Why? Because the public has lost trust. He's communicated a lot of mixed messages. He uh, came across as being rather mean in his response, suggesting initially that all the government's support program was going to be was going to send two masks to every household, and many of them arrived and they were moldy anyway. This obviously has hit him in the public opinion ratings. If we then compare Britain, my country, although I'm a Brexile here in Dublin, my country, Britain, and Italy, these are two countries with essentially similar disastrous health outcomes, similar level of death per head of population, similar types of mistakes. In one country, Italy, the prime minister is at pretty high approval ratings. In the other country, Britain, Boris Johnson in the last few days has fallen to what are called negative approval ratings. I'm not entirely sure what's meant by that, but it means he's plummeted in the polls. Why is this? It's because he's lost trust, whereas Prime Minister of Italy has maintained trust throughout the pandemic through clear communication, consistent decision-making, and essential uh, demonstrations of fairness and, and equity of treatment. We are, of course, in a time and in a crisis in which transparency and flow of information is vital. So one of the strengths of our democracies, the liberal democracy has, has come through, which is the plurality of sources of information. If you don't like what Donald Trump is saying, you can listen to Andrew Cuomo. If you don't like what Boris Johnson is saying or his scientific advisors are saying, you can rely on a country like Britain to have a former scientific advisor set up an independent scientific ex expertise group and they can provide information. So we have a plurality and transparency of information that gets beyond these issues of public trust. But let's be realistic. This is the health phase. We're now going to move into the economic phase. During the health phase, economic policy was about and essentially disaster relief about keeping people you know, surviving through uh, this disaster. The economic phase is going to be the biggest test for our democracies. Governments are going to have to decide how and when to withdraw welfare supports. They're going to have to decide how and when to deal with the public finances. They're gonna to have to work out how and when to open up the borders to more travel and tourism and, and, uh, and helpfully facilitate trade. They're gonna to have to work out all sorts of issues of uh, choices of hard trade-offs uh, of the sort that democracies are there for, but which inevitably put them under new strain. We thought 10 years ago when uh, liberal democracies went through the global financial crisis and all its aftermath, that this was hopefully a once in a generation test of how our democracies work. Unfortunately, we've got a second one uh, and we're only just in the beginning of it. And I do think that this economic phase is going to be uh, much the most difficult part. It's often said that we should build back better. And it's also often said that governments have learned the lessons of the 2008 crisis not to withdraw uh, government support too soon and not to repeat the mistakes of austerity. All I would say at this point is don't bet on it. Build back might be the words, but better is the sort of thing that governments with stretched public finances aren't going to be absolutely reliable upon. And I'm not sure when austerity with, will be reimposed or whether it will be too soon. I think that this will be uh, the, bit, this, the next big test of our, of our democracies. The third point I would like to make, which is related to what's going on in this crisis, but is also about the long-term issues of, uh, of uh, democracy, is about the nature of accountability. I've said that uh, countries vary in public criticism and opinion poll ratings according to this uh, rating of trust and confidence and a sense of the competence of 
in their governments, whether regional or, or national. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, well, how is accountability actually going to be uh, levied? How is it actually going to be expressed in the end? As was said by Eileen, by you in the, in the introduction, currently we are not able to get out into the streets, but we do have a hyperactive form of accountability and expression called social media. But the, the concern that was building up before this pandemic is I think going to be my big concern and I think an important concern for academic research, which is whether social media really is an effective form of expression and accountability or whether the bubble effect, the cocooning effect, the sense that people just simply listen to people they agree to, which then allows uh, governments like Boris Johnson's in the UK or Donald Trump's in the US to brazen things out uh, and to in effect choose their own messages, whether that comes, comes about. I have some confidence that things will be better than they might look, but I'm waiting to see. The second big question is that issue of Pluto, Pluto democracy that Eileen introduced. There's a lot of talk in this pandemic about this being finally a time to deal with the inequality that has built up over the last uh, 20 years or more uh, in many of our Western democracies. Again, I would say don't bet on it because the big structural issue in democracy that remains in place is the role of political finance, the role of vested interests, the role of wealth in determining political outcomes. Mansa Olson, great political economist, wrote his book, The Rise and Decline of Nations, to analyzing how uh, in democracies decline can set in when vested interests get so powerful that it distorts political processes. At the time he was writing, it was his concern was a lot about trade associations and trade unions. Now it should be about essentially plutocrats uh, and about the distortions in the donation process that uh, they bring about. So there's a lot to worry about, even as I begin by saying that actually the democracies have so far had a good pandemic. I'll stop there. Thank you, Bill. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, so I think I'm gonna turn right to Melody to pick up. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Eileen, for facilitating the conversation and to Jane, uh, we deeply appreciate your leadership and it's such a pleasure to be on a panel with Bill and with Fenton. And I'm looking forward to the broader, uh, our broader engagement. And I want to pick up where Bill left off in talking about some of the challenges to the public sphere uh, and say that the public sphere in many ways isn't working very well. And for those who have historically struggled in the margins of democracy, the problem has been made all the more challenging by the pandemic. And I want to start out uh, and use maybe as a leitmotif, as a theme for my comments, with the case that I believe that many of you are probably quite familiar with, so I won't belabor uh, recounting of the facts, but just a very uh, quick reminder for those who may not be familiar, but that's the case of the American Ahmad Arbery. Um, many of you have read what happened to him about three months ago on February 23rd, he, an African-American man, was jogging through his community outside of Brunswick, Georgia, when uh, a man and his son, who were white, saw him jogging and believed that he might be involved in a robbery of a home that was being under construction in that community. They grabbed a shotgun, they grabbed a handgun, they jumped into their truck, they pursued him, and ultimately they killed him. Um, one of the men that was involved had been, the older man who was involved had been both a former investigator in the prosecutor's office, the local prosecutor's office. He had been a former police officer in the police force in that community. And ultimately prosecutors in that case ended up recusing themselves. 
and for quite some time, no arrest was made. The case is now being investigated by federal authorities and arrests were made just last Thursday. So literally three months after a man was killed in broad daylight and after reporting by the New York Times, the release of a video that captured the confrontation and after celebrities and civil rights activists and lawmakers drew attention to the case. I recount this briefly because of two sentences uh, or maybe even just one sentence that was in Times reporting. They said, for weeks, the killing was not widely known about outside of Glenn County, Georgia, where it occurred, in part because the coronavirus related lockdowns distracted the nation and made local public protests difficult. I think this captures uh, in very stark and very painful ways why the public square, why the public sphere is so important. And there are a few points that I'd like to make about democracy and the importance of the public square building from that. Um, one, as Eileen said during her introduction, for marginalized communities, for those who have remained on the fringes, who have been pushed into the fringes, the crisis caused by COVID-19 is layered on top of chronic challenges, including the delta between liberal democratic aspirations and the reality of democratic life. And certainly the inequitable administration of the rule of law is a perennial problem. It is not new to the pandemic. Um, and similarly, access to the public sphere to participate in democracy, to participate in a way that often ensures greater transparency, that helps to hold public officials accountable, um, those are perennial problems as well. And in fact, again, going back to the Arbery case, local residents in Glenn County, Georgia have asserted years and years of police misconduct. In fact, just days after Mr. Arbery was killed, the police chief was indicted related to a cover-up involving uh, an officer's sexual relationship with an informant. And that police officer had been brought on board to try and clean up the police department. So years and years and years of these challenges, of these problems involving public officials that had not yet been brought to light. Second, the public square has played a critical role in bringing attention to injustice and creating an opportunity for greater accountability. And as a result, citizens will create a public square. And I think of just about American history and those who, again, have existed on the margins, those who have been treated most inequitably, generation over generation over generation, in spite of significant hurdles, have found a way to create a public square, have found a way to bring greater attention to their travails. And they have often, in recent years, been aided by technology in doing so. Um, across our democracies, the public square plays an important role in calling attention to threats to the rule of law, whether they are protests in the streets or acts of civil disobedience, whether they're hearings in front of legislatures or courts. And for that reason, people have found a way, as I said, to create the, um, a public square. And we're recognizing the role that technology plays in that. And I think we can think about all of our democracies and flash to moments where technology and social media have played a role in bringing attention to an issue. But as Bill has said, technology is a double-edged sword and we have to consider the role that it plays in our democracy. Its ability to continue to fracture democracy. Um, as we often talk about in my household, um, technology doesn't necessarily do anything new, but it takes what's already been do done to scale. It makes it happen more quickly and it, off, it does it in greater numbers. At the same time, social media has also drawn attention to that which would be unnoticed. And we have sadly, very painfully, an even more recent case. And for those of you who have heard about George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, another African-American man who was handcuffed, arrested on the ground, um, but killed, murdered, when a police officer put his knee on his throat for five minutes. 
Um, and despite the begging of those surrounding him, in spite of officers who stood by and watched, uh, George Floyd died in that instance. Again, this was captured on social media. This was and shared in a way that allowed, allows people to understand the injustices that are taking place in our democracy, um, to call attention to it and to bring public pressure, to bring the rule of law um, to the fore to try and hopefully address these instances. So finally, what we've been seeing during the pandemic requires us to double down on what we already knew, but hadn't taken the steps to adequately address. And it requires something from all of us. I know from Eileen's recounting, there are people in the Zoom room on this participating today um, from uh, across the social sciences and uh, the uh, cultural institutions, the humanities, and all of us um, from our disciplines and as citizens are required to engage. There are important questions that I believe data scientists and social scientists, the market and policymakers have to ask and address when we think about issues of social media. We know that genie is not going to be stuffed back into its bottle. So can we harness it in a way that helps us fuel liberal democracy, more and better communication and deliberation rather than undermine it? As consumers, what will we do to reject that which undermines democracy? And as citizens, what will we encourage policymakers to do? I don't pretend to be an expert in this way, but in the Democracy Initiative at the University of Virginia, we have an interdisciplinary lab led by Siva Vaidnathan, who is the focusing on whether or not there are platforms that can be devised that actually encourage greater del deliberation rather than undermine it. There are also questions that we have to ask and answer in our communities and as humanists and as cultural leaders. How can we reconstitute community and think more expansively about who constitutes the public in the public sphere? What steps should we take to build a more robust and inclusive table to begin to address the issues of entrenched inequities of wealth and power and opportunity that Bill was talking about during his comments so that we enliven the public square to solve problems and to build consensus, which, and we know this is far easier said than done and hundreds of years tell us that story. Um, together with the challenges posed by technology, can we address what scholar Hugh Hecklow described as a righteous insistence on opening the public square for all of the previously excluded to be heard without a serious effort to really hear and weigh the views of others. To strengthen the public square, and I, I say this in conclusion, I think that we have to build, not just rebuild, but to build civic infrastructure. And we, it's important for us not only to think about that on a federal level, but to think about that on the community level the place where we bump into each other, where we are forced to address challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, where we come most frequently face-to-face -face with those with whom we disagree, and to build a theory of identity and purpose, as well as the social and economic policies to support it. I'll stop there and look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Melody. Um, Fenton? I think it's already you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning and, and good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, lovely to be with you all. Um, very hard to follow two such brilliant contributions, but um, uh, let me perhaps shock everybody by um, going in the opposite direction to Bill and, and, and going from the pessimism to some kind of optimism. <laughs> um, so, I think um, Eileen brilliantly laid out the the reasons not to be cheerful um, at this particular moment, uh, and and I I don't doubt um, the veracity of of any of those enormous challenges and and difficulties. Uh, we have had a very dramatic um, demonstration of uh, both the necessity for a variety of sources of information. Um, for independent thought and and 
not just independent thought in the abstract, but independent thought that actually impacts on the public realm. Uh, and at the same time, the enormous challenges, even at the most practical levels, much of the so-called mainstream media, certainly the newspaper world that I'm in, is has had its entire economic model, which was already under huge threat, basically taken from under it. Um, advertising has simply ceased to exist. And, and uh, so the uh, challenges are, 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 are very, very real and very immediate. Um, but I'd, I'd just like to say a couple of things that I, I think are, are perhaps hopeful about the current moment. Um, one is that the strong men have turned out to be very weak and they turned out to be weak in public. Right? So we, we've been living through a period in which the pre-fascist appeal of the leader, white man leader of destiny um, uh, has been incredibly powerful in, in very many parts of the world and indeed not just white men, you know, uh, I mean, figures like Modi in, in, in India, you know. Um, uh, this sort of, although of course expressed in very different contexts and, and, and different languages, this common theme of the world is carnage, to use Trump's uh, term, and I alone, as Trump says, can, can save you from it. Um, you know, that's, that's well, call it what it is, it's a, it's, it's a pre-fascist moment that we've been living through. Um, and uh, it's, it's all been based on an idea of power. It's been based on an idea that, you know, if you support me and don't question me, I will exercise power on your behalf. And the most fundamental part of that power is security, right? I will, I will save you. <laughs> and to put it mildly, um, the, the strong men have been rather disappointing in terms of their performances, right? So, so objectively and publicly, and in ways that people can see and understand, They've all been disastrous, um, uh, uh, and uh, th they have done us the favor. So even with a constricted public sphere, they've done us the favor of of, of performing this disastrousness themselves. Right. So I mean, tr Trump, you know, commandeering a couple of hours every evening on on live TV to show what a. a, a complete disaster he is and how utterly he lacks even basic empathy with people who are suffering, uh, never mind competence to deal with, with the crisis um, is, is the most extreme example of this. But if you look also at the deflation of a figure like Boris Johnson, you know, a, a very successful cartoon creation, uh, this Boris figure who, who has just simply disappeared. It's, it, it, it's as if there was you know, one of those um, valves in his in in his back, and it, somebody has opened it, and the air has come out, and he has to try to behave like a normal politician, and 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 turns out to be completely incompetent at doing so. Uh, and I think this is a reason to be cheerful. Actually, um, it, it's not a reason to be um, to be glib, because of course there will be a reaction, but by these movements and and by these leaders, um, and we already see it with Trump in terms of paranoia and blame of other people, but nevertheless, the fact is that it has played out very largely in public. Uh, it's not accidental that the four worst performing governments in the world, probably, although we don't know the full story yet, are Britain, the United States, um, Brazil, and Russia. You know, and we can, people can draw their own conclusions from that. Um, secondly, and related to this, one of the reasons for, for some kind of optimism is that the language which has enabled people like Trump and Johnson particularly uh, has become more and more difficult to use, right? So it's a performative language. It's a language which is, you know, um, taken seriously, but not literally, you know, it's, 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 it's all in quotation marks. It's, it's all a show. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's only truth. It's only value is not a truth value. It's a, it's, it's a provocative value, right? It's the value of, not being politically correct is the, the only um, standard by which it wishes to be judged. Uh, and it's been very successful. You know, it, 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 it has worked to the degree that these people are in power. Um, it, it, it's become more and more difficult to use. Um, the analogy one might draw here is the, uh, 
the often misunderstood story of King Canute, uh, Canute as he's sometimes called, you know, who, who is said to have, you know, gone to the seashore and ordered the, the waves to retreat. Um, in the story, of course, he does this in order to show that there's a thing called reality, which, which even the monarch cannot change. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a demonstration of the idiocy. We had, we had Canute, I mean, we had Trump saying, it will all disappear, basically it'll disappear because I want it to disappear. You know, uh, we had Boris Johnson saying, it's, it's all gonna be fine, it doesn't really exist. It's, we're, we're on top of all of this sort of stuff, you don't need to worry about it. Um, so we, we've had the King Canute moment, but by people who lack can you use self-awareness and who, who didn't understand what it was they were demonstrating, but has nonetheless been demonstrated to citizens at large, right? which is that there, that there is objective reality and that ironizing it and, and, and um, uh, treating it as, as, as pure performance actually doesn't help you very much when the virus doesn't really do irony, doesn't get it. Um, uh, and I think that changes the nature of public discourse. I mean, you know, it, it, it's it's very interesting to be in journalism at this time. You know, people are not particularly interested in provocation. You know, they're they're interested in news. There's been a huge, just a big turn towards news. It's not just that people are subscribing in much larger numbers to mainstream media, as we must now call it, but also that they're what they're reading in mainstream media. If you look at the top read, most read things, and certainly most English language newspaper websites, they've, they've moved more towards very obvious old fashioned news. Um, news is problematic, but it recognizes the existence of reality. It's, um, it, it implies that we're all members, uh, to use that derisive term of Karl Rove, of the uh, reality based community. So the reality based community has, has, has returned. Um, thirdly, and very briefly, um, there's a lot of talk about, about globalization and are we at the end of globalization? Well, Actually, one thing that's been very interesting in terms of the public square, I think, is a global consciousness. Um, I don't want to be glib about this, but it's very striking that people are understanding their own reality in a global context, not just in the sort of Trumpian way of this is the Wuhan virus or the Chinese virus or all that sort of stuff, but actually also using a sense of international comparator to understand their own experience. So, so I think it's true that what a lot of people are saying around the world is, how's my government performing in relation to other governments? And, you know, it, this is remarkable. I don't remember a time in which this has been so much part of daily discourse. Uh, how are they doing in Taiwan? <laughs> Why are we not doing as well? I mean, it's, this is not, you know, high level expert discussion anymore. It's, it's there. So, so perhaps there's a, an idea of globalization there, which, which might be a little bit more, um, more positive. Um, uh, fourthly, uh, and remarkably in, in this period, um, to be optimistic, public opinion has continued to operate. Right? Um, so I absolutely take the point that you've had this, this huge vacuum of the traditional public square of people's ability to, um, to gather, to protest, to, you know, to, to be visible in, in the way that they need to be. And one certainly hopes that that will return quickly. But nevertheless, I, I, I think if we had said in the abstract that you were going to lock down societies, that you were going to have so much fear, uh, that you, we were going to be in this kind of crisis mode where a lot of decision making, even in the countries which are being well governed, is command and control. I mean, a lot of it's top down, you know, this is what you must do. One would not have said the public opinion would continue to operate as a force in that context, and yet it's actually been very powerful. Uh, it's been very powerful in, in, in positive ways. Um, for example, if you just look at what's happening in the UK at the moment with the, the Dominic Cummings story, why is that a powerful story? It's a powerful story because of well, it's old fashioned muckraking, muckraking journalism, but it would have died in a day, uh, except for the fact that public opinion is still operating. People are contacting their politicians. People are, are expressing their rage through things like emails and, and you know, simple stuff. Uh, so so the, the prospect for public opinion still exists. And I think public opinion has also been validated because it's part of the scientific narrative now, right? Which is that you cannot maintain consent for public health measures unless the public is 
active and actively engaged in, 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 in that process of consent. Uh, and finally, and I think this is where, um, and I, I, I completely agree with Melody in this, I, I think this is where the key challenge may, may well be. If you were to be positive about it, there's a sort of odd and paradoxical effect of the way in which the coronavirus crisis has been represented in media terms. And it's this, it's that uh, actually previously invisible people have become visible on a relatively significant scale. And I simply mean ordinary workers, um, uh, the, the, the immigrants who staff care homes, um, the poorly paid people who deliver your food from the supermarket. Um, it's not just that these are now visible and at a much higher level of consciousness in terms of public um, awareness, but also in terms of media, I, I, I suspect if you're interested to do content analysis uh, in the future, but I, I suspect it's a very long time since you have had long TV features about what it's like to be a carer, uh, about what it's like to be a cleaner in a hospital, um, about how do you go about your job if you're packing supermarket shelves. <laughs> you know, th there's, there's a visibility to people who are invisible. And I think, then just to finish, I think this is, and it relates very much also to Bill's critical point, I think is, the challenge then is, if you take that positive thing out of this period, how is that visibility maintained in the discourse, the economic discourse, which is to follow around rebuilding, right? which is, who, who, who are we rebuilding for? Who's doing the rebuilding? Who are the actors in society? Uh, so the coronavirus crisis has revealed uh, that the actors in society are, are um, all sorts of people who have previously been called marginal, unskilled, um, you know, who, who have largely been without a voice. It, it, to be optimistic, I think it's going to be harder to, to, to make those invisible people, make, make those people who have become visible, invisible again, in the economic discourse, but that's going to be the absolutely crucial democratic challenge and, and, and the challenge for all those of us who are engaged in any form of public discourse, which is to say, hold on a minute, what about the people whom we all felt so dependent on uh, at the height of this crisis? Thank you. Um, there's people uh, in the various rooms who, who want to uh, ask questions. And I actually, I think I'm going to call Dan Carey, who's in the Zoom room, has um, two questions. Uh, so I think I'm just going to turn it over to, to him. Dan, can you? I, thank you, Eileen. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have two uh, questions that I think are probably unrelated. One is, what the panelists think in relation to the, the, their respective countries about the prospects for some kind of inquiry afterwards. There's already plenty of references to that in the UK. Uh, in the US, one imagines such a thing being swamped in politics right from the get-go. In Ireland, I suppose there's some prospect partly because we're a little bit more in that British tradition of inquiries being an established form. But are you optimistic or pessimistic about the holding of them and what might come out of them? My second question is from Melody, and it's, I think in a way it picks up almost on something that uh, Fitton was saying about uh, just now. It's about the, what I call the hyper visibility of African Americans and their simultaneous hyper invisibility. Um, and I was thinking of a comment that Eric Foner made in a seminar that I organized last week, where he was remarking on what would it have been like if uh, the protesters in Michigan, armed protesters in Michigan had been African American your thoughts on those two questions. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, yeah. I'll kick things off on, on both questions. Well, thank you for both of them. Uh, starting with the first on the inquiry, I think in the United States, to pick up on yeah, your frame of thinking, yes, there will be inquiry. My sense is that anything that happens in Congress, maybe that's unfair. The concern is that what happens and is operated by Congress, will it be seen as being 
um, as unbiased uh, as possible. That raises questions about when the inquiry takes place, um, given the fact that we have an election that uh, will take place in November. Um, if it happens after the election, you know, what the House and the Senate looks like, do the House and the Senate draw upon or identify an independent set of individuals, you know, in the same way that uh, there was a look back at what happened after 9-11. Um, so there are different forms it could take, um, certainly in those instances, and I, I worked in Congress for many years in the House and the Senate, um, there, there, there's always a layer of politics um, that takes place, but will they do as much as they possibly can to make that look unbiased uh, and to be unbiased? At the same time, no matter what happens in Congress, my guess is that there will be some kind of inquiry or set of inquiries that will take place that will be clearly um, in, independent of government. Um, academic institutions, for example, um, think tanks uh, may try to build their own panel, some kind of bipartisan panel to look uh, back on this uh, and determine what happened, why, and what should happen going forward. So I think in the US, it could take not only a form, it could prob will probably take a couple of different forms. Um, and your question about hypervisibility and hyperinvisibility, which I think is a fascinating question. Um, even given the hypervisibility, um, there are issues, I believe, of humanity and inhumanity. Um, that those who are seen, um, but still not considered uh, on in the hierarchy of human value to uh, possess all of the humanity that others do, um, which would then allow you to literally put your knee on the neck of a man and in spite of everything that you are being told and you are witnessing, um, kill him like he was an ant at a picnic. Um, it, is, it is just that brutal and difficult to look at. Um, and I think you are right. And I often think along the lines that you do when I see protesters and I imagine what if they had been black? What if in Glen County, Georgia, two black men had grabbed their guns and jumped in a truck and pursued a white man um, in that way? Um, but I think that goes to issues of, of worthiness and issues of humanity and the hierarchy of human value um, that lets, uh, let people make those decisions and often for society to respond as it does or will not. So Fintan or Bill, do you have? Could I just maybe um, just address the question of inquiries? Um, I, I completely agree that there there should, and I'm sure there will be inquiries in, in different forms after it. My, my worry about it is that there's a tendency at the moment for those in power when asked questions to say, mm -hmm. look, you know, we're very busy at the moment, we're in a crisis, we can ask those questions in the inquiry whenever that happens. It's, it's almost a trope now of a lot of um, political response. Um, and of course, the fact is that the, the crisis is not over. It, it, it's, it's very much unfolding, will continue to unfold for many, many months, even in its, its health phase, you know, before we get to the, the economic one. Um, and it's crucial that there are mechanisms of accountability and questioning uh, on an ongoing basis so, so that lessons can be learned. The difficulty is that our discourse around that tends to be one of blame. And there are very obviously people <laughs> uh, who deserve every possible opprobrium. Uh, but it's difficult to do an, an inquiry in, in the context of having to say, look, this is new. Um, there, were, uh, there was a lot about this that was unknown. Horrendous mistakes were made. Some of those mistakes were made because of, you know, the absolutely malign conduct on the part of people in power. Most of the mistakes were made simply out of ignorance and trial and error and, and, and not knowing what to do and, and people doing their best and, and missing things. Uh, so how we have accountability in the, um, the, the, the period of the next few months before we get to the stage of 
the look back inquiries, I think, is an absolutely critical one. And one of the things I've been trying to push for all the time is to say, you, you know, just because we're in a crisis doesn't mean that asking difficult questions is wrong. On the contrary, it's it still saves lives because if if you don't build in skepticism and questioning and accountability, then the mistakes that have been made will be will be repeated. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Well, just briefly to add to those, I mean, I I, I agree with uh, both Fintan and, and Melody on, on much of that. I think um, in terms of uh, countries I know best. Um, one, it, first point one, I'm looking at official inquiries. I think it does depend on whether there's going to be a change of government or not. Uh, in the case of the UK, I cannot imagine that uh, Boris Johnson's government isn't going to organize an inquiry into its own conduct um, during uh, its term of office, which goes on until 2024, um, at least officially. Uh, so I wouldn't expect there to be, as it were, an inquiry into the conduct of, of what's happened um, in the UK. Uh, you might get that in Italy, which I, I spend a country I spend a lot of time in, um, because there it's not so much a partisan issue how what happened in the health system, rather it could well feed into the build back better question. Second point, there are really two sorts of inquiry that might transpire. One is the accountability or what went wrong in health terms and the pandemic directly question. And I would agree generally there's those we need the, the whole thing to play out a bit further before we before we get to that. But the second type of inquiry, which I hope will happen, is an inquiry which said, why were we so badly prepared for this risk? And are there many other risks which were also badly prepared for? Um, in other words, uh, are, we, we screwed up on the pandemic. Which other things might we screwed up screw up on next? And that will be an easier one for governments to set up. Uh, and so I would, if I was a government, I would, uh, I would uh, divert attention by organizing that type of inquiry um, and say that people are going to be busying away at that for months and months on end, um, rather than have the accountability inquiry. And I think they'll try to dodge that. Great. Thank you. There's a question on um, Facebook, and this is mostly for Finton, though I'm sure they uh, Colleen Morrell, who, who has posed it, would be glad to hear anybody else's opinion about it. Um, she wants to know what, what you think about the new trending insult from the last 24 hours. It's at scum media, which appears to have been whipped up by supporters of Dominic Cummings. And she wonders if, um, is this the UK turning into the US and managing to spin everything as fake media? But I think it also addresses Finton's point about how public opinion um, is continuing to be expressed during the pandemic, as he pointed out, in more positive ways. But yeah, so the, the backlash. Yes, um, it, it's very striking uh, that you have had in the last 48 hours um, an increasing Trumpification of the, the the right in terms of this discourse, certainly uh, the social media uh, far right in Britain is is using uh, all of the same tactics and 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 all of the same kinds of insults. Uh, I think it's 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 a mark of desperation, though. Um, uh, the shock for Boris Johnson and for much of the Tory right in Britain of course, is the shock of having their own attack dogs turning on them. It's like you've, you, you, you've had, a, you've had a, an, an Alsatian, a vicious Alsatian that only ever attacks progressives and liberals and socialists. And now um, it's gone rogue and it's biting you. And, and you don't know what to do about it because of course, the, the most damaging attacks on, on um, the British government over uh, the the Dominic Cummings affair have not even come from the Guardian and the, and the Daily Mirror, uh, which are on the centre left, uh, and who did the in, in, initial investigations. It's really coming from uh, the Daily Mail uh, and um, tabloids like the Daily Star, which today its front cover is a Dominic Cummings cut out and keep mask. 
And the instruction is, if you put this mask on, you can do whatever the F you want. This is very damaging stuff for them, you know, and it's it's stuff that's not going to go away. And the sort of fake news stuff, it, it, I, I just don't think it's working. Um, it, it, it's, it, 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 there are, you know, it's, it's, it's a real sign of, of, of um, disorientation. Uh, it, it's been absolutely fascinating to watch that particular story because um, Cummings is supposed to be above all a media genius, right? This is what he does. <laughs> and the absolute inability to, to cope with it, to deal with it. Um, and, and the reason that story is so toxic from the point of view of the, the, the pre-fascist right, of course, is that it, it, it blows the gaff on elitism. The most powerful weapon in their armory has been the ability to take actual divisions in society, divisions between rich and poor, between uh, you know the haves and the have-nots, and turn them into divisions between the people and the elites. And it's been incredibly powerful for Trump. It's been incredibly powerful. It's the force behind Brexit. Um, and the coming thing just destroys it, of course, because if you were an agitprop, uh, old fashioned agitprop, you know, socialist theater company trying to make up a parable about elitism, you know, uh, you know, I made all these rules for you. And then I went to my country estate, uh, you know, to, to break all the rules. Um, you know, you, you, you simply couldn't come up with anything worse. So this is one of my grounds for certain kind of optimism in that actually this this whole the, the comics thing is just a it's, a it's a very good example of something which I think is larger, which is this 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 notion of the people versus the elites, um, I think is losing some of its power and, and I don't think they know what to do without it. So Melody, I wonder if you have thoughts. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, yes, <laughs> you get caught up in, um, in thinking about that. I, you know, I was thinking about Fenton's last comment. Well, first of all, I have to say, uh, I'm just meeting Fenton, just met Bill. Um, and I feel like we are soulmates in many ways. I am an optimist by nature. Um, and uh, I, I often see the world not only half full, but, you know, three quarters full. Um, I, I am concerned, though, about the, the lost grip that you were describing on um, populations and this idea of um, the, the people versus the elites and whether or not it still has strength and, and still has power, um, particularly in our, our media environment and the way that I'm experiencing this in the United States. Um, because it is so siloed um, and because people are able to consume what they want to consume when they want to consume it and, you know, nothing else is happen happening, um, that people, and this, it goes back to some of the, something you were saying before about science and reality-based, uh, uh, looking at your comments, uh, reality-based community. And I, I think I'm concerned that people have so constructed their own reality and are able to exist in that world um, that not even facts are able to penetrate. And that includes this idea of the people versus the elites. The elites believe in data, the elites wear masks, the elites are weak, um, and the elites are spinning a hoax um, of COVID-19 for the rest of us um, that, um, that still has, it seems to, seems to still have significant strength here. Um, one of the things we were chatting about a bit before this began was a piece that was in the New York Times over the weekend about uh, the healthcare experience that people are having, the rate of COVID cases and COVID deaths with an overlay of counties won by President Trump, won by Hillary Clinton, and the reality is that people as a healthcare matter are having different experiences um, because of the demographics, because of the dense urban populations versus more spread out rural populations. Um, and as a result, that's also playing into the polarization 
that already existed here and seems to be hardening that um, as opposed to people also reading and understanding while this may not be affecting me in pick your place, um, I can see what's happening in New York. I can see what's happening in Chicago. I can see what's happening in New Orleans. And as a matter of civic health, um, as a matter of public empathy, how do we manage this um, in a way that takes into account that entire experience? But instead, instead it seems to be very fractured um, and very polarized um, and fed into by the media environment that allows people, as I said, to see and hear what they want to see and hear. Right. Bill, do you wanna pipe in here or not? Well, I'd, I'd only add that um, I do think that uh, I would be more worried about that polarization if I was in America than, than uh, I am in uh, Europe because I think that our media, while it has fragmented uh, enormously, it hasn't polarized in this, to the sort of extent that American media has polarized. So that um, television in particular, which after all is the main media that uh, most people get their, their information in the news from, rather than newspapers or magazines. Um, Overwhelming of the NHS, and I remember I was looking back at my notes. I can, he, I can hear in the background for some reason on here. I can hear Boris Johnson speaking. Um, was that coming through somebody's radio? It wasn't mine. Not mine either. But <laughs> it's almost as it's almost as if he's he's with us. Zoom uh, bomb, yes, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think in Europe the television is not as politically um, polarized uh, as uh, in the United States, and I would be more concerned if I was in the United States because of in effect the Fox News, CNN. Uh, factor. Um, what we have lost in Britain certainly is uh, the the anchor of um, a BBC that and, uh, and and mainstream television, which used to act as a kind of arbiter of fact, and they stepped back from that in recent years, particularly over Brexit. Uh, but they are still there, and they are some to some degree uh, still playing that part. Uh, I I still think though I, my optimism about America would be. Uh, there, because I do think that there's a large independent voter uh, um, category. Uh, and I look at Trump's victory in 2016, and what was striking about it was the number of people who voted for him who had previously voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012. So that means there's a lot of people at play. Um, and that makes me feel that it is more, there is a more traditional electoral question um, uh, at least about the floating voter, about the independent voter, uh, than we might worry about. That doesn't mean that social uh, polarization that, that could lead to other forms of social disorder that democracy doesn't mediate wouldn't be a danger in this polarized world. Right. One of the things I think that sometimes people outside the US don't realize is that the largest um, group of voters are Democrats, I think, still, but followed very quick, uh, quickly behind by independents, and yeah. that the number of Republicans is something around 24%, but you would never know it from our politics. Um, Angie Butler, who I think is in the um, Zoom room, has a question that pertains to this, which is, um, I'm going to let let her ask it, but it's about the is if there really is a meaningful distinction anymore between traditional media and social media. So Angie, are you there? Hello, hi. Hello. Thank you for such a, a brilliant uh, discussion and a fantastic panel. Yeah, my question is, can we draw a meaningful distinction between traditional media and social media anymore? Um, our lives are so fused and infused with the virtual that arguably we can no longer differentiate between the virtual and the real. Even individuals who are apparently off the grid are accounted for as data performing in networks that they did not sign up to. Uh, it, that's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant question and I, to hazard an answer, I, I would say that for more and more people in terms of consumption of media, there's no meaningful distinction. Uh, however, there is a meaningful distinction from the point of view of production. Uh, and it's simply to do not so much with technology or means of distribution, 
it's to do with professionalism. Uh, there's still a core of people who are in the business of, at least as far as they can, um, producing some kind of objective um, reporting um, and analysis um, and do so uh, often extremely badly, but nevertheless do so with some professional compass, right? So, so, some sense that they uh, this is their job and that they, even for no other reason than that it, that it is their job, <clears throat> they have a vested interest in the maintenance of the reality-based community. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, if everybody can simply make shit up, then there's not going to be any journalists getting any paychecks, right? So, so even at the basest level, the mainstream media has some interest in maintaining um, Th that idea that that some things are real, um, that there is information as opposed to um, simply uh, performance of constructs. Uh, but the, I think what your question points towards is how meaningful is that if if at the consumption level people don't know the difference or don't really recognize the difference. I know if I write something in the, the Irish Times or the New York Times and my students in Princeton have read us, they'll always say to me, I read your thing on Facebook. And I said, I don't write for Facebook. And I said, no, you do. It was there. It was on Facebook. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I said, but Facebook didn't, you know, didn't produce this thing. And I mean, they look at me with absolute incomprehension. I mean, they just don't get the point <laughs> that there might be a production process. And in Marxist terms, you know, if you talk about alienation, the, the alienation from the means of production um, of the consumer, I think, has become almost absolute. Can I ask a question? <laughs> Just to follow up. Is, I'm curious, and I feel like I'm so fortunate to be here with two uh, journalists and people understand media in the way that you all do. Is part of the challenge in the new media environment, given what you said about pr production and the difference in production, but is there also a challenge with the what stories get told, um, given who owns what, just given sheer space when you're producing a magazine, though a weekly, when you're writing for a newspaper, when you think about television, that, um, that we're shrinking the, the kind of stories and the breadth and the diversity of stories that need to get to told in, tradi in traditional media? I don't know, I'm, I'm curious. I think that's a it's, a, it's a fantastic question. I'm sure Bill has a lot to say, but I, what I'll just say very briefly is, uh, y y y yes. So there's always been this problem, of course. There's always been the problem of, of plutocratic ownership. There's always been the problem of the, the, the bias towards the rich and powerful. Uh, there's always been um, the biases inherent in the unequal nature of who gets to be a journalist. Um, I'm old. When I started out, there was still a lot of working class journalists. So reporting was often just thought of as a kind of working class trade. Um, opinion writing and, you know, editorials was for educated, um, you know, university educated people. But that's gone. I mean, nobody gets to be a journalist now without without a postgraduate degree. And that, that has huge implications because only the kinds of people who get postgraduate degrees are going to end up in journalism. So the, the, there are those big structural questions, but it's got worse simply because uh, the um, when I started writing journalism, I sure was the same for Bill. Nobody knew what the hell anybody was reading. You know, if they bought the Economist or they bought the Irish Times, that was fantastic, great. You know, <laughs> they might just be buying it for the crossword. Uh, and if you were doing a long and um, detailed um, analysis of marginalisation in in, uh, in 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 the beef industry or whatever, you know, that, who who knew? Now they know, and they know with absolute precision who's reading what at any given time. So every newsroom now has a sort of live display of this is what people are reading right now. You know. And everybody who works in journalism knows that um, if they want the numbers, um, there are certain things they can write about over and over again. Um, and so the, the narrowing actually comes from the metrics uh, as much as it comes from, you know, all of the, the pre-existing conditions. But, uh, I'm sure Bill has, has things to say about this too. No, I absolutely. I, I, I think that, uh, and this is me sounding, this is me sounding like a, a grouchy old editor emeritus here. I think the worst thing that's happened in traditional media is metrics. 
is knowing too much about who's reading what and where. Um, I absolutely think that uh, newspapers and magazines should be uh, edited, edited by and, and chosen by, with articles chosen by people who don't know what readers want, but who nevertheless curate an experience for the reader, which the reader may or may not like. And if the reader likes it, they'll go on buying it. And if they don't, then they won't. Um, and I think that we should think of it as being like create, curating an exp exhibition or curating um, a, uh, um, a, a theater performance rather than um, responding to those metrics that are going on um, in the background. So I, I do worry about uh, news organizations where the metrics have taken over. Now most ha that hasn't happened, but in some, I think it clearly has. Supplementary optimistic point I would say is that uh, actually there is a proliferation of, me of traditional type media now, it's online and it's subscription based uh, largely because advertising is, has basically uh, uh, died. Um, but there, there's more and more um, available publications. The question is whether they are financially viable and that depends on their subscription model and whether, whether uh, readers are willing to pay and therefore whether the journalists can get paid. But uh, nevertheless, um, I think that there's more diversity. Uh, what there is maybe a problem with is, is, is a lack of uh, of, of uh, information and comment and so on that that is widely read by a wide wide part of the population, which used to be a function in Europe at least of public broadcasting, um, and that is clearly diminished and, and, and under challenge. We don't have a common conversation in quite the same way as we used to. Great, thank you. I'm going to take a, a question from Facebook. This is from. Um, Bao Bao Zhang, um, who's a, a postdoc in the Cornell Society of Fellows, and he wants to know, how do we translate the shift in public opinion, um, which is, is, you know, we can be optimistic about, um, to have them play out in electoral politics in order to create improved political institutions. He's particularly worried in the US context about the fragility of the electoral system and, uh, and in fact, how it's at this point we know is being undermined by bot driven um, social media. Um, so a lot can go wrong in November, as he points out. Um, even if the public demands accountability, the political system is not necessarily built to be responsive. So. He's wondering what you guys think about that. Bill, do you want to start? Well, I start by maybe yes, comparing the U.S. to um, to my own country, the U.K. I think that this is a big problem in winner takes all systems, um, where uh, which the U.S. is partially a winner takes all system. The U.K. is entirely a woman a winner takes all system, at least uh, as it has traditionally. Um, uh, exercised itself, and that does lead to uh, a difficulty in in with the representativeness aspect of democracy. If democracy is about accountability and governance and representation, uh, a, a first past the post winner takes all system always uh, loses out on representation, and can only then kind of rescue itself in voters' minds if they feel that it'll be their turn next, um, and that their voice will kind of get its turn. Uh, and I think that uh, as the two major parties in Britain have had a declining share of, of the, the total vote, um, actually that's been become increasingly not true uh, and increasingly a, a difficulty. And um, I absolutely think that Britain needs electoral reform and to move towards a more proportional system, uh, possibly the, the single transferable vote type system that, uh, that uh, uh, Ireland uses possibly another form of proportional representation, but that is where the problem is. In the US, of course, it's the question is about the balance between Congress and the, and the, and the, uh, and the White House. Um, the White House is a binary choice, but Congress is meant to be the check and balance. Um, and I think we, we would change over time on, on, in views as to how well that works uh, and whether, whether, particularly as Congress has become less prone to be bipartisan on, in, on issues. Um, whether um, there is something really problematic in the system that needs to be looked at. Mel, 
Melody as a token American on this panel? <laughs> Yes, I, mean, I was thinking about the question and also listening to Bill's comments. I mean, pre pre COVID, there was certainly a robust debate, litigation, um, focusing on several things pertaining to the way that our elections work on the federal level. Everything from looking at the electoral college. Um, understanding why 200 plus years ago people um, devised that system, but what it has wrought now as compared to the popular vote, um, issues of access to the ballot, um, issues of voter and voter su suppression, um, Voting Rights Act concerns, all of those were active debates. Um, I, in the context now of COVID and watching some of this play out under within the realm of how do you protect and keep people healthy? Um, so early voting, um, voter by voting by mail, early registration, all of these issues, which were loaded politically before. Um, now you add a health care context to this um, and it's driving those issues forward but we're still seeing the same kind of polarization and resistance while people are also very concerned about the gamesmanship um, that will that took place in the last election and we expect to take place before i think unfortunately the our ability to have a rational conversation in this hyper -par partisan environment um, about what would seem to be in my opinion, common sense. If we are as patriotic as we say, if we believe that citizenship has a responsibility of voting, why do we make it so difficult for people to vote and at the same time spin stories of, of voter fraud um, that just factually data wise are not proven to be true. But our ability to uh, have those conversations seems to is, it's just, it's fraught right now. So I, and we're also witnessing an environment where despite people saying, we've got a pandemic, things will be bad in the fall, we anticipate, prepare for it now. And there seems to be very little um, preparation uh, underway to make sure that people can vote safely um, and take and consider some of the, the options um, to allow that have been proven over time to work in various parts of the country for the US, members of the US military, for Americans living abroad, um, it, it seems as though we are unfortunately quite stuck. Benton, do you have any? Uh, ju just briefly, um, I, I'm conscious I'm speaking from outside the United States. Uh, uh, I think I'm not saying there are not huge democratic problems um, elsewhere. And one of the nice things about the John Dick Cummings story, of course, is that he is uh, the person who's probably most responsible for uh, the illegal uh, and immoral corruption of the um, referendum process that led to Brexit. Uh, you know, fraudulent overspending and 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 using the um, Cambridge Analytica data to 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 target people, stolen data. Um, so it's not a uniquely American problem, but I would still be much worried from the out, much more worried from the outside about the U.S. than I would be about any other democracy at the moment. Um, simply because there's what you don't see in most other democracies, right, is an open, stated determination to stop people voting. You know what, what's astonishing looking at it from the outside is, is is where you have a presence. Well, if, if all these people voted, sure the Republicans would never get elected. So so therefore, voter suppression is what we're going to do. And it's it's open, it's racist, it's 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 a um, flagrant denial of the very basics of democracy. Um, democracy is a lot more than voting, but you know voting is is the thing that that that, that drives it um, and. It seems to me um, that the, the right to vote, which was really only won, really uh, on a, a, a 
a broad level in the United States in the 1960s. It's a, it's a very recent and fragile phenomenon and it's, it's been taken for granted, um, but, but it, 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 it's, it's threatened uh, more openly and directly than it has been since the Voting Rights Act. And um, it would seem to me that there might be an urgency around a massive civic campaign not on a non-partisan basis based around the right to vote. I mean, it seems astonishing in the 21st century that we're we're back with a 19th century argument that people have a right to vote in a democracy. But looking at it from the outside, that the, the threat to the electoral process in the United States seems very, very real, very immediate and actually quite open. Right, I think one of the, um, the Voters Rights Act, as you point out, came in in the 60s, but it was gutted pretty, strongly um, just before the last election, right? So that um, we really are in a sort of pre-civil rights moment as regards to voting and voter suppression. Um, and that the only way we're really going to be able to change that is if we have, uh, if the Democrats um, get both houses of um, the government and can pass a new basically voters rights act. But, Anyway, I think we have time for maybe one more question, which is um, uh, Thiago Moyano, who's I think in our Zoom room from the University of Sao Paulo, um, has a question about how to, you know, protest and speak up when the normal ways we do that aren't um, aren't available to us. Thiago, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Eileen. Um, so, yeah, so um, I, I want to, I'd like to hear a little more from the speakers on uh, what can we do now when it seems that, you know, the, the usual progressive form of protest, um, the power of assembly has been sort of reversed and now, you know, staying at home is what uh, liberals and progressive people have been doing and, you know, for example, here in Brazil, we have a lot of right-wing supporters uh, on the streets and uh, denying the pandemic and questioning um, its legitimacy on, and any kind of social isolation measures. So, you know, um, do we have to rebuild or create a new form of speaking up? I, I guess that's my major question. Thank you. I could start. I mean, um, I, I, only to say I, I you know, I, I would follow Fenton's point and that uh, public opinion has actually been speaking out pretty strongly uh, during this, which is partly through non-associative traditional means of, uh, of uh, email, telephone and so forth, um, answering opinion polls and so on. But also, one, I don't think that, that uh, the uh, ability to associate out in the street um, will be away for all that long it may it may well go and come back and go and come back as the, as, as second and third waves of this issue come back but I, I don't think we should consider the current situation to be permanent but secondly uh, during the lockdown in Italy for example um, people who wanted to protest found creative ways to do so out in the streets in a socially distanced manner um, there was a big demonstration by um, like uh, this was sector by sector, but by restaurateurs in, a, in the Piazza del Duomo in Milan, um, which drew attention because I guess the newspapers had nothing else to write about. And therefore, there's an extra uh, um, channel, um, which otherwise you wouldn't get. So I think that uh, progressives will have to have be creative in this environment um, and uh, creative in finding new means of expressing themselves. But I, I don't think that there's any change to the basic uh, to the basic. Um, requirements of, of uh, getting getting outreach and getting together and um, and getting your message out. Melody? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, two things that may sound very different from one another. Um, and one, to build on Bill's point, I, I think there are lots of ways, and we've talked about how technology has been used. We've talked about the way that people have done that physically during this time. I will harken back to my time as 
an aide working in the House of Representatives and the Senate and something and in the White House and know that I know to be true, everybody pays attention to how many calls and emails they get. <laughs> um, they pay, they count, they pay attention. And that is a way to let your voice be heard and to lodge your concerns. Um, at the same time, and something that may feel very different, and, and um, I believe this, and for everyone out there who um, is a part of the cultural community, um, I taught a course this past spring on President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, the Great Society, and the 1960s. And one of the things we did, in addition to talk about the policy and the law and the courts, et cetera, was talk about the, ro the role that artists and the role that culture played in driving change during that period. And I would also say in addition to all the emails and the calls and all of that, that there is an important role for, for artists um, to play. Music um, was a significant driver of public opinion, of sharing messages, of stirring people um, in a place where data and facts don't often move people. And, and certainly when they are joined, they can be very, very powerful um, tools and weapons to create public opinion um, and to drive change. So I think we have to think in a very uh, creative um, and multifaceted way about how we convey public opinion and how we go about shaping change. Great, thank you. And Fenton? Uh, very briefly, just, just really to echo what Melody has said. Uh, so as well as using the old fashioned, well, now old fashioned <laughs> methods of emailing and phoning and, and writing letters even, you know, um, uh, I, I completely agree that art is, is central to this, right? So, uh, and street art, art on the street. It, 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 historically, we know that the far right wants to take control of the streets. That's, that's when pre-fascism starts to become fascism is when they control the streets. And we can't let that happen. And equally, as the question implies, it's very difficult because decent uh, concerned people are staying at home <laughs> and, and allowing the worst elements to be out on the streets. Uh, the only answer to that is um, making images on the streets, you know, making uh, creative protests. I, I mean, I, I just saw there were some lunatics out in Ireland, um, you know, far, far right people. The response to them uh, was like three, three. They happened to be guys, three young, young men. Just and it went out wearing tinfoil hats and shouting stupid slogans, you know, uh, to mock them, just to mock them, you know. And and what happens then is all over social media, the image of the three guys in their tinfoil hats. It's a great image. It's going to be in the newspapers. It's you know everybody wants to see it. It's funny. It's smart. Um, it 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 hits them where it hurts, right? Which is 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 mockery. Uh, so uh, creativity, mockery, courage, image making, um, creating viral images. You know, in this in this time of the virus, I think uh, might be a very powerful kind of protest. It's a wonderful way to end here our portion of it. I'm going to turn it over to Jane now. Jane, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Eileen, that was wonderful. I mean, what a fabulous set of contributions. Great conversation. Um, lots of unanswered questions. So this could have gone on. Um, but before I say a few words of thanks, I've got a couple of announcements. Um, a survey will come out. It's different from last week. Do take a few minutes to answer it if you wouldn't mind. It's really important that we assess just uh, the impact that these five seminars have had, these workshops have had. Um, today, sadly, is the final um, uh, one in the series, but we have recorded all of the others, so feel free to go back to them. They're all on the Hub and the Heyman uh, websites. So, so uh, uh, you can catch up on the ones that you've missed. Um, as we said, or Eileen said at the beginning, this series really builds on the living curriculum that we developed on the foot of our uh, Crisis of Democracy and Cultural Trauma Institute. And obviously that's available. We'll put the details in the chat. We'll follow up um, 
uh, with emails, but we would really love now to add these workshops to that living uh, 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 curriculum, because I think it all helps to create community. The very fact that colleagues from India, from Brazil, uh, uh, from other parts of the world, South Africa have been part of this conversation as well as Europe and the United States shows that this is a global problem. We need global solutions. We need a global community. And obviously our work continues. This has just been a very important um, uh, part of that journey. Um, and so uh, uh, we, we really want to encourage that community to grow. I'm very struck by Tiago's question at the end and just what colleagues in Brazil are going through at the moment. Um, and when we were there in December, we went to visit some of the favelas, including one called the Mare, which is the largest favela in Rio. Um, they're doing amazing work to fight the pandemic. And I know Tiago has a special uh, a cause that he's asking us to support. And we'll obviously circulate the details of that as well. But our colleagues in Brazil also want to uh, publish a collection of essays around cultural trauma and the intersection uh, with the crisis of democracy. So we're going to be sharing that with everybody who's joining us this afternoon too, in case you'd like to be part of this conversation, we would certainly welcome it. So a few very quick practical announcements. Uh, at the Hub, we continue to operate virtually. We have a science and art reading group that meets on the 4th, uh, uh, so next uh, Thursday. We're doing a special for Bloomsday, which is Tuesday the 16th of June. It's entitled Ulysses Pandemic and Social Distancing. So we hope that you can join us. That's five o'clock Dublin time and noon New York time. Uh, and then on the 30th of June, uh, we have uh, Unlocking the Archives, a research showcase from beyond the 2022 uh, project. Again, you can sign up for these on our website. And once you've signed up for everything in Dublin, please sign up for the events at the Heyman. Uh, today at the Heyman at four o'clock, uh, we've got Building Publics, Humanities, Combating Isolation, Walking, Mapping, and Reimagining the Environment. And then tomorrow at the Heyman, uh, we have, which is three o'clock New York time, eight o'clock Dublin time, the next installment in Care for the Polis online series, Infrastructures of Violence. So lots going on. We hope you'll continue to join uh, both uh, humanities uh, uh, centers. So I just want to finish now with a few heartfelt thank yous. Firstly, actually to Eileen. Eileen, as always, the Heyman has been a joy to collaborate with. Trinity and Columbia have this very special dual degree program and this research collaboration. Actually, the MOU was signed uh, uh, at a fake news fear and faction event that uh, a, a number of us, uh, Bill and uh, Finton were at. So it's lovely to see the relationship go from strength to strength. It's been a pleasure to work with you and your team uh, in the Heyman but also Bruce Shapiro and Seamus Khan, who've been very involved too. So a big, big thank you to Eileen and her team. I want to thank then the team in Dublin, uh, Aoife, Giovanna, Katrina, and Francesca. These women are just amazing and they make things run so smoothly and um, really cannot thank them uh, uh, warmly enough. And a very, very, very special thank you, though, for Ellie Payne, who has done all of the heavy lifting uh, in terms of organizing uh, this series. She also has a wonderful article um, on, uh, 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 it's called What the Dominic Cummings Scandal Means for Our Democracy. So to pick up on some of the points that Fintan and others were making uh, earlier, and that's on her.ie. So Ellie, well done on your article, but thank you again for all of your hard work. I want to thank all of our participants who have joined us from all over the world uh, over the course of the last five weeks and of course here uh, today. You've been an amazing uh, audience and thank you for your questions. Thank you for your uh, uh, just enthusiasm for it. We've really, really valued your participation and your great questions. But above all, I want to thank our amazing speakers across the series, but especially this afternoon. I think Bill, Melody and Fintan, you've been awesome. I think the conversation could have gone on for much, much longer. So even though we're tucked away in our attics, in our studies, in our kitchens, in our, in my case, my porch, I think you know we should all just uh, uh, put our hands together and thank you for an amazing afternoon. So thank you very much indeed.
So everybody, uh, this is goodbye. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please stay well, take care, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Jane. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.